this morning. I'm excited to be here. I feel like I have a word from the Lord this morning that's kind of been on my heart and kind of been um, meditating on this week while I've been away. Um, most of the time, I love to preach Bible stories and use different elements and to use different things, but sometimes I feel like it's good just to come to something simple and a simple instruction in the Word of God, and hopefully uh, this will help us apply what God has planted in our hearts and to our lives. And so we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2, almost in the very back of the Bible. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse number 12. We're going to read verse 12 and 13. I'll give you just a moment because I still hear some pages flipping in the Bible. But when you do get there, if you'll stand for the reading of God's word with me this morning, Philippians Chapter 2, starting in verse number 12. Um, I really want you to pay attention to what the Lord is saying here through the Apostle Paul in this epistle to the church at Philippi. And the word of the Lord says this in verse number 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let us pray. God, we love you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to come into your house and worship you and lift up your name. God, I thank you for the choir and the worship that's been lifted up to your name. God, I pray, Lord, that you would open the ears of the people this morning and anoint my lips just to speak your word and your word only this morning, God. And I thank you for everything that you're doing in this place, Lord. And we honor you and we give you all the glory and all the praise for you are truly the one deserving of it all. And it's in your holy name that we pray. And the church said, you may be seated this morning. I want to give you the title of this morning's message. Most of you might assume, based off of my text, it'll be something like God will work it out. And that is something that everybody wants to believe about the situation that they're facing, is that God would work it out, whether it's custody battle or medical situation or relational tension, or you've just got trouble in your life. But the message that has kind of been on my heart this week that God gave me for this morning is just one word different from God will work it out. Instead of God will work it out, I want to preach on God will work it in. The NIV version of the Bible says it this way, and I just want to read it to you for context this morning. It says, therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act and to fulfill his good purpose. See, praise the Lord for what he's working out in our lives. Praise the Lord for what he's working in. In Philippians chapter 2, in these two verses I read, the Apostle Paul is writing an epistle to the church in Philippi. And both of those are miracle. The fact that Paul is an apostle is the first miracle. Paul, the artist formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, is when the Lord wanted to reach the Gentiles, he found somebody who was persecuting the church, which is kind of crazy to think about, that he wants to reach the Gentiles, um, that he's going to find somebody who is persecuting the church. I don't know where I went in this monitor, but I'll strain my voice if I don't hear myself. Um, but he found somebody who is persecuting the church, and the persecutor of the church is now the lead pastors of the church. Wouldn't that be crazy if Pastor Eddie was the lead pastor of this church, and before he was, he was persecuting every single one of you? Most of y'all probably wouldn't be sitting in this room right now. You'd be like, man, he persecuted me. I'm not going to be in here. But the person that was persecuting the church happened to be the lead pastors of the church. So you never know how God is working in somebody's life. Don't write people off. Don't pe count people out. Don't slap a label on them because this is the way that they always are. The way that God is always means more than the way that they are. Some of that went right over your head because I was talking too fast. So I'm going to read it a little slower to you and tell you a little slower. The way God always is, who he is, means more than the way that they always are. Aren't you glad that the way God is means way more than the way that you were and the way that you are? Some of us, that's a good thing to think about is that God is more than what we are. Because if, if we were more than what God is, some of us, most of us, all of us in this room would be in a real sticky situation in life. Can I get amen? amen. Don't ever underestimate how God can work in somebody's life. Think about that. He took him from the persecutor of the church to a preacher. If he can take him from a persecutor of the church to a preacher, think about what he can do in your life. I, I guess he needed someone who understood the system from the inside in order to over, overturn it. That's why God will often call you into something that you struggle with because the thing you struggle with is the most, the most is the thing that you're most qualified to help somebody else step through in life. 
So when the Lord needed to reach the Gentiles, he said, I, can, I can't call Peter for this. I'd better call Saul and change his name to Paul. So it's a miracle that he's an apostle, and it's his whole title, Apostle, the Apostle Paul. He had been something completely different, and God changed him. How many of us are thankful in this room that we were something different, and God has changed our life? I don't know about you this morning, but I'm thankful that I'm not what I was, but instead I'm who he has created me to be. I'm who he envisioned when he made me, and he was sitting there and said, this is Brandon, and this is, this is who I'm creating. I'm thankful that now I am who God has called and created me to be instead of who I was in my sin. Can I get amen this morning? See, there's one reason we're praising him this morning while we're in here in church. We praise him because he didn't leave us like we were thankful for that this morning. Y'all are being quiet on me. That should cause something to explode on the inside of you when you realize this. he takes persecutors and turns them into preachers. See, the second miracle I mentioned that there were two in the text is not implicit. You have to go beneath the surface to get this one. He's writing the letter, the epistle. It was written to a specific audience, the church at Philippi. It was not written from where it, it was not written from where it was written to. It's a miracle this scripture exists because of the conditions Paul wrote it in. Not a writer's cottage by the sea where it was nice and pretty and he woke up in the morning and had a cup of coffee and listened to the waves go. Not a retreat situation in the mountains where he can hear the waterfalls all around him. Rather, he wrote this from prison. And I wanted to point that out to you because sometimes you get more focused on where you are than where God has called you to do and to be. Oftentimes we get so focused on where we are in our current situation that we forget where God has called us to be and where he's taking us in life. We get so focused on, well, our finances aren't great. Well, well, my family's sick, or I'm sick, or my, my son or my daughter, they're, they're away, and they don't know who Christ is. And we get so focused on those situations, not realizing where it is that God wants to take us in the end, in the end place in the first place. We get so focused in the valley, or we get so focused in the down moment that we get blinded to what it is that God called us to and what it is that his promises are for our life. Uh, we've talked about this several times, but he's faithful to fulfill every promise in your life, no matter what it is. You can go ahead and take it to the bank and say that if God says it, that it's going to happen. Man, if there was stock market and what God says, that would be something to put your money into because it would be skyrocket high and you would get a good return on your investment every time you put in. Because guess what? Every time that God has spoke something, every time he said something about you, every time he spoke something over your life, guess what? He's been faithful to complete it to the end of the day. And guess what? Let me just submit to you something this morning. I've said it before and maybe you need to be reminded this morning that if God spoke it and you say, well, it ain't happened yet. Guess what? You're still breathing and there's still a heartbeat in your chest. You may have a pacemaker to make it beat. You may have it off beat. You may have something going crazy on, but guess what? You're still alive and that means the promises of God are still there and he still will do what it is that he said he will do. You're not dead yet, so don't give up on him yet. Take what it is that he's spoken over your life and said to you and know that he's going to be faithful to complete it. Paul didn't let his current circumstance, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I'm sure Paul sitting in the middle of the prison could have said a lot of things. He could have sat and wallowed in his mess like some of us do. We sit and wallow and we look at our current situation and say that it's never going to get better. We're never going to make it out of this. We're never going to do better in life. We're always going to have grief. We're always going to need healing. We're always going to need this and we're always going to need that. But understand this morning that you can't look at your present circumstance to determine where you're going. Ronnie said this last a couple weeks ago and it stuck with me that the biggest thing in your car is not your rear view mirror, but it's the windshield that you look out of because it's not for you to look back and see where everything is as the smallest piece. Sometimes you need to reflect on where you've been to keep you going forward, but you've also got to remember that you've got to look forward through the front windshield to see where it is that you're going because if you're constantly looking backwards, you're going to go backwards, but instead look forward to what it is that God has called you to, what he has for your life and not your current situation. Sometimes you get more focused on where you are than where God has called you to be, and you start acting like your environment rather than changing it. Some of you are placed where you are to change your environment, not to become your environment. And we need to get the mindset that God has placed me here to change my environment, not to become this environment. 
We are placed in this world, but we're not of this world. We're here to change the environment of this world. And man, if we would, if y'all would come to Sunday school, I wouldn't have to preach my Sunday school message twice. This is three Sundays in a row. I've talked to you about my Sunday school message, and I told you I wasn't going to do it. But if we would be the church and do what the church is called to do, then what a difference this world would be. If we would be the church, we talked about it this morning, and be the church and do what it is that the church is called to do, this place would be full. It would be like when they tried to take the man on the mat and they couldn't get in the church. They had to tear a hole in the roof. They wouldn't be able to get in the doors if we would be the church and if we would truly love one another and truly care about one another and truly do what it is that God called us to do, and that's to love one another and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you're actually a great, faithful child of God, but you get in an environment and you start changing. Paul would get in an environment, get in an environment and change the environment, not become the environment. That's what made him different. The Apostle Paul, while serving a prison sentence, is writing sentences now that we call Scripture. The beautiful thing about this miracle is you may not be an apostle but, and, and you might not write an epistle, but let me break it right down to where you live. Any situation in your life that isn't getting better, you can do what Paul did and you can get busy while you wait on it to get better. While you're waiting for it to change, change. While you're waiting for a better opportunity, obey. See, David was waiting on an opportunity, but he decided to obey, and guess where he ended up? He ended up with a sling and a stone and defeating a giant because he obeyed what it is that God told him to do and what it is that he was supposed to do. Oftentimes, while you're waiting, why don't you just go ahead and obey God and what he's telling you to do in the current moment? Will you say, what am I supposed to do in the waiting? You're supposed to worship him. You're supposed to lift up his name. Do what it is that he said that you need to do. You need to read your word. You need to pray, which is what Pastor Eddie talked about just a few moments ago in case you weren't listening to the announcements and to what he was saying. But there's things that you can do in the waiting that will change what's going on in your life the Bible says that Paul was a great man of faith and yet his faith did not keep a snake from biting him but his faith enabled him to shake the snake off of his hand and use the incident everything that happens in your life good or bad you can use it see Paul writes to the church and says therefore my dear friends as you have always obeyed I think it's some kind of reverse psychology that Paul's trying to use because they're fighting and arguing. And later in the book of Philippians, his name checks to he name checks two women and tells them, Y'all stop fighting. That's in chapter four, and I'm not gonna preach it this morning, but he says, If you were able to obey not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, think about the sadness of Paul, the apostle, being in prison. He's in a shipwreck. He gets on another boat three months later. He goes to Rome. He's under house arrest for two years, and he writes four epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, and the prison epistles, they call them that. They were written in prison, but we quote them in church. So where you are right now has tremendous potential in your life. Even your darkness has tremendous potential to be harvested to bring somebody else light. We talked about that this morning in Sunday school. I told you I wasn't going to do this, but I'll do it anyways. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning, how you can encourage somebody out of your darkness because now you're on the other side and there's light. Maybe you've been through grief. Maybe you've been through heartache. Maybe you've been through a healing. Maybe you've been through something in your life. And guess what? That was a dark moment in your life, but you're on the other side. And now you see the light of where God worked through it. But the person beside you, they may may be going through that exact dark moment, and they need you to encourage them and lift them up and say, hey, I've been through this situation before. I've been through it before, and it's been dark in my life. I've been through that darkness. But let me tell you about a man named Jesus. Let me tell you what he can do for you. Let me tell you how he can pick you up, dust you off, and make things better in your life. Let me tell you how he got me through it. Let me tell you how he picked me up. Let me tell you how he continued to walk with me hand in hand. Let me tell you about how when I couldn't walk any further, he picked me up and carried me. Let me tell you about when I was down, he picked me up. Let me tell you about when I was hungry, he fed me. Let me tell you about when I was thirsty, he gave me drink. Let me tell you about when I needed the blood of Jesus, that it washed me white as snow. Let me tell you about how when I needed healing, Jehovah Jireh, the provider, provided healing for my life. Let me tell you about a man named Jesus. We are the church and we're designed. Listen, I got a whole message that we're working in together this morning. But let me tell you about we are the church who is designed to go and tell the world about a man named Jesus. 
about his love, about his mercy, his grace, his healing, and how he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for you and I and for them. And that's what it is that we need to be sharing with the world. Listen, I know we've got an election on Tuesday, but your political opinion is not as important as the blood of Jesus. What you think about on Facebook, about what you want to post. Listen, I ain't been reading your Facebook posts this week, so don't think I'm harping on you. Listen, I haven't had a whole lot of internet access, so don't think I've been looking at your Facebook posts. So let me tell you something. Your political opinion is not a place for you to condemn somebody else and for you to look down on somebody else. But instead, you can share the love of Jesus and let them know about a man named Jesus who can wash all of their sins away, who can heal them, save them, redeem them, and do what it is that he needs to do. Some of y'all don't like that this morning. See, the Bible says that who calls his light to shine out of darkness gives his Holy Spirit into our hearts. And we have this treasure in earthly vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. It's God doing it. It's God throwing Paul in the cell, but it, was, it wasn't God throwing Paul in the cell, but it was God on the inside of Paul that caused him to pick up a pen while he was in there. Because he picked up a pen while he was in there, you and I are praising God over stuff that he said today. Somebody else needs to be praising God in five years because you didn't give up. Somebody else needs to be praising God in 10 years because you stayed the course. What you need to keep going is on the inside of you. Say it by faith this morning that it's inside of me. That was about four of you. It's inside of me. Thank you. He said you have an opportunity now. The opportunity is this. Paul says absence is an opportunity for application. If you're writing it down, that may be something good for you to write down this morning. I'll say it again just in case you missed it. Paul says absence is an opportunity for application. That's the best thing I'm going to tell you all morning. Let me ask you something this morning. Do you work through the word that you've heard or does it go in one year and out the other? In the parking lot, you get stuck in traffic, and you start lifting up your hands, but only one finger on the hand, and that's a single finger praise. I'm using it as a joke because I don't want to feel condemning because how many words has God given me that I did not work through? I don't mean you have to take notes to be saved. God knows he's not going to check your highlighter colors when you get to heaven and think, man, you use pink. Pink's an awful color to highlight that verse with. You should have used highlighter yellow. Matter of fact, you can't see it, but you should have used highlighter orange. I'm glad y'all can laugh with me this morning. Because Jesus was a volunteer. He volunteered to go to the cross for you and I. Bless God. Go Vols. The process by which, let's get back to the message this morning. The process by which you mix the word with faith is when you take what I say and ask God, what are you saying to me about the situation through what the pre preacher said this morning? The, that's the process where you filter. That's the process where your faith is strengthened. When I say God will work in it, I'm not just trying to be clever or say something catchy to you this morning. I thought about how we're wanting God to affect situations, and that's great. But Paul said, my absence in this prison is actually a gift for you in Philippi. Because when you're hearing the word or when you're learning something, you're getting it at a mental level. And that's wonderful. Instruction is wonderful. I believe that I've told you and when I was younger in life about how I had hitting and pitching lessons before I played baseball. And they would give me on instructions on how to get better. I used to go to a garage, which seems kind of sketchy now, but my father would take me to somebody's garage, drop me off, and I would have hitting lessons. And, and Dustin Black would sit there and teach me how to hit the ball and how to be better at hitting the ball, how to move my hips and throw through the ball or swing through the ball. And then on Saturday mornings, bright and early, I would go to Steve Searcy's house for pitching lessons. And Steve Searcy would watch me pitch and watch how my body moved. And then he would come to me and say, hey, we need to correct this and this and this because you're throwing like this. You're doing this. There was instructions that they gave me. But the instructions meant nothing if I did not apply them to what I was doing. The instructions mean nothing if you don't apply them to what you're doing in life. 
You can highlight in your pink and orange highlighter all you want. And you can write in the margins of your Bible all you want. And you can make it look real spiritual so the person beside you is like, man, I need to do better at reading my Bible. Theirs is highlighted. Mine's not. But understand, they may be highlighting their Bible, but that doesn't mean they're applying the, the, applying the instruction to their life. See, I could have never have got better if all I did was just simply listen to the instruction and not apply it to my sport. Same thing with the Word of God. You can listen to the instruction all you want, but until you apply the instruction to your life, nothing changes. You've got to apply the instructions. It's wonderful, but the thing about his instruction is it's unlimited, limited until you have the opportunity for integration. Integration happens when you were taught is challenged or tested, and you have to remember under pressure that what you learned in peace. So be careful coming to church, because in this church is a peaceful environment. God is going to provide a peaceful environment. For Paul, he provided a prison where he wrote four epistles. For the church at Philippi, he did not leave Paul's physical presence with them, but he gave them his presence presence within them so that when Paul's presence was taken away from them, his presence was within them intensified. What I'm trying to say is that anything in your life that goes away, you think you need it, God is going to release something greater in your life that you didn't even know you had until you got into a situation where you need it. So eventually Paul says, continue in it. If you would, look at your neighbor and say, as a praiser, when do you praise God? Ask them, when do you praise God? That was about half of you, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk to the other neighbor that you might like a little bit more and ask them, when do you praise God? That's still about half of you, so I'm going to give you one more opportunity. I'm going to start staring at the people that don't turn to their neighbor, and we're just going to wait. You know how you were in class, your teacher just sit there and wait until you stop talking? Ask your neighbor, when do you praise God? I'm proud of you. And here's the moment that I want to talk about this. You can tell them the lyrics from a great songwriter. He says, well, I praise them when I feel like it. And I praise them when I don't. I praise on the mountain. I praise in the valley. I praise when I'm sure. And I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I've got it. And I praise when I don't. I praise when I feel it. And I praise when I don't. In every situation in life, I praise God. Because guess what? I woke up this morning, I'm going to praise God. I may not feel it. I may not have goosebumps on my skin, but I'm still going to praise God. All hell may be breaking loose around me, but I'm still going to praise God. I may be sick in my body, but I'm still going to praise God. My husband, my wife, my any of this may be sick, but I'm still going to praise God. Why? Because he gave me breath in my lungs, and the blood of Jesus has been applied to my life. And if he don't do nothing else for me, he's done that. And so I choose this morning to give God praise for what he's done for me. The absence is an opportunity for application. What I love about God, a good instructor is never satisfied with simply the assimilation of information. A good instructor will sometimes create absence and life will Maybe you're in a season right now where it's very important that you integrate what God has given you in your life. It is feeling intense right now because the absence of something you think you need to have. Paul said, in my absence, much more than my my presence, you have to remember that what you know about God. In the absence of joy, you have to remember how to rejoice. In the absence of harmony, you have to remember to be a peacemaker. In the absence of money, you have to stay creative. God will sometimes take resources away from you to remind you what you're not using in your life. Some of you don't like that. But I think as much as God's presence provides comfort, absence creates opportunity. I want to really get this home with you this morning. So just bear with me for just a moment. Paul wanted the church at Philippi to know, I'm still talking to you even though I'm in this prison cell. God wants you to know, I'm still talking to you even though you're going through what you're going through. I'm still with you. The Bible says that he sticks closer than a brother, that he's still with you in the midst of your storm, that he's still with you wherever you go. All you have to do is recognize that he's still there and say that I can't do this all by myself, God. I need you, and I know that you're there in this situation. I want you to know I'm still talking to you even though you don't know how you're going to make it. God wants you to know I'm still 
talking to, even though you haven't felt goosebumps in a while. And while everybody else seems to be rejoicing, you feel kind of empty. God said, this is not absence. It's integration because my sheep know my what? My voice. The most powerful moment of your life. To work a word from God is not just when you're putting it in a journal to write it down, but when you're putting it into practice to live it out. This is a practice season for you. This absence you feel, this thing that has changed. I wish I could sit down and get to know every one of your exact situation so we could have an exact conversation. But Paul wrote one letter to the whole church and said, it's good that I'm gone. That's why Jesus said to the disciples, if I leave you, I'll send you the Holy Spirit. I can send you something greater than just my words. I can give you my spirit, greater integration. God is doing something greater in your life. Something goes away and something greater comes. This is the rhythm of God. God will work in it. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, I can't get off of this this morning. God said the absence of what you think you need in this season is an opportunity for you to get attuned to what you really have on the inside. Might I submit to you, you think that you need something else to get through this season of life, but the Holy Spirit that dwells within you is exactly what you need to get through this season of your life. God has already supplied you with everything that you need to make it. You say you can't make it because you need this or you need that, but let me submit to you that you can make it because the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, that leads you, that guides you, that directs you, that points you in the right path already dwells within you. I want you to see that the absence creates opportunity for application. I don't know if you thought it was weird when I read it, but he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Watch this. He didn't say work for your salvation. He said, work out your salvation. He's not saying earn it. That's contrary to everything else that Paul gave, that God gave Paul to teach us. That's contrary to the very essence of the cross of Christ. How are you going to earn grace that was given from a cross that you didn't die on? What he's saying is not only to integrate what you've been taught, what you've been instructed, and apply it. Now, fear and trembling is saying that they had, like we might say, lock, stock, and barrel, which means everything that they would say, fear and trembling, like a saying. When he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he does not mean be afraid that God didn't give you what he promised to give you. He said, you're forgiven, and you're forgiven. He said, there's no condemnation, and there's no condemnation. It is being afraid to live your life without the awareness of that because you know if you ever lose awareness of who God is to you and in you, you will make the stupidest mistakes in your life. So I want you to work out what God has already worked in. God is already working on you, and then you are a work in progress. Progress, But your salvation is not a work in progress. At the moment that you ask God to forgive you and apply the blood of Jesus to your life, you are forgiven in that moment. And from that moment forward, God is working on you, and you're a work in progress. Your salvation is not a work in progress. It is finished. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, and God had already worked that out. If you've placed your faith in him, you're already saved. Now you're talking, t- taking what God gave you and working it out. God is taking you deeper in this season. He did not depart from you, but he's taking you deeper. Man, i got to hurry this morning. You're worried about something that God has already worked out. Why do you do that? Because you stop at verse 12 and never read verse 13. Do you know how many people will take verse 12 and stop right there? Therefore, since you are obeying, when I was there, keep that same energy. Paul is saying when I was preaching, y'all were saying amen. Now keep that same energy. This is coming, this coming Tuesday. No matter who wins the election, no matter who's acting crazy, Keep that same energy because we had Republicans, Democrats, black, white, Hispanic, male and female all in the same church, and we're all unified. We will not let a culture that divides us be greater than a king who defines us. Y'all keep that same energy there in the world. It doesn't matter who is president because Jesus is still king. Some of you are so worried about who's about to become our next president that you forget that Jesus still sits on the throne. And guess what? The world is his footstool. And what he says, it will happen. So guess what? It don't matter who wins the election. Jesus is still king. And he's still going to work things out. (laughs) 
don't know where that came from, but I just decided to work it in this morning. You may not know where the temptation comes from, but you need to decide to pray extra. Because if we're going to get extra temptation, we're going to need extra grace, and we're going to pray for extra prayers. And we're going to work this in. The reason you keep worrying about stuff God has already worked out is because the way you keep thinking. Not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you read that, you would be worried because you're trying to work out something without God. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. That's a very interesting thought in it, isn't it? It is God who works in you. Don't forget that while you work it out, don't forget that, that don't forget, don't get so good at trying to figure stuff out on paper that you forget to work stuff out according to purpose. The Bible said it is God who works in you to do, to do the will and do according to his good purpose. God starts with the purpose, not the person. And then he finds the person who will accomplish that purpose. And he shapes the person who will accomplish that purpose. That's why you can know God is working on you right now and working in you. I see you stressing about something in your life. I don't know what it is. I don't need to. God knows. You play out the situation over and over again. You call it preparation, but it's not preparation because it's eating through your peace. Here you are thinking, well, when I get to that in three weeks, it's going to be terrible. Oh, my kids become teenagers, yet they're not even toddlers. I see you look in a situation and the future of your life, and you're afraid. I'll tell you why you're afraid. That you forget that God is going to be there with it when you get there. I wish you would remember with all the scenarios you're playing out in your mind and all the ways that could go wrong and the stuff you're scrolling through, talking about is it another world war or you're watching CNN, which you shouldn't, but you're watching all of these news channels and you're watching all of this stuff and you're thinking, why in the world is it that we're where we are? And whatever happens, you're going to have God. If it's a prison, he'll be your cellmate. You're going to have God. Some of you have forgotten that you've got God in it with you. That's why you shouldn't be stressed about your retirement because you've never seen the righteous forsaken. You were young and now you're old, but you've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging for bread. God is going to be with you in this. God is going to be in this challenge with you. God is going to be in the uncertainty. God is going to walk into the doctor's office with you. God is going to be on the other side of a painful breakup with you. God is going to be with you when you make your first appointment with a counselor. God is going to be with you through grief. God is going to be with you every step of the way in your life. God is going to be with you when you open up your finances and begin and begin to get it in order and humble yourself. Don't forget about God. Don't forget about him. Trust in him. There are things in your life you need to stop stressing about at a level that assumes you're going to have to do it alone. God is pretty good at Godding. I'm so tired of hearing people say life be lifing because God be Godding. I think sometimes we take the journey in our, in our mind as if God is not going to be there. And I hear the Lord saying to you this morning, I'm going to be there. Even if Paul wasn't there, even if nobody else is there, even if you've never seen this before. Joyce Meyer said, worry is a down payment on a problem that you've never had. Isn't it just like the devil charging you for stuff you don't even need, that you didn't even order? I think it's as simple as it sounds sometimes to just assume that God is going to be there. That we should just sit in it for a minute. What would it change about the situation you're afraid of facing if you knew God was going to be there? Miss Helen, if you want to come to the piano, I'm going to try to close. How much would life be different if we would just realize that God is going to be there? That God is going to take care of us. That God is going to do what it is that he said he would do. That he's going to be faithful to do what it is that he said he would do. Somebody in here this morning or watching online, you're listening to me who's waiting for God to work it out. God is saying back while you're waiting in this dark season for me to work it out, for me to show you the next step, for me to give you the next crumb, for me to give you the next notice, for me to give you the next relationship, for me to turn this thing around, for the report to be positive while, you, while you're waiting for me to work it out. Work it in. I hear God saying work it in. For it is God who works in you.